Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 889 for August 16th, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. You'd have asked anyone 30 years ago, Mark, I can tell you the one thing they would not have described is the situation that we have in whiskey today, not just in Scotland, but all over the world. I mean, whiskey, you know, it's just an explosion of stuff going on. Um, Some of it great, probably some of it not so great, but that's what you would expect. There's so much money coming into uh, into, into the business from from investors who want want to get into the distilling scene. And 30 years ago, people would have just laughed at you if you described the situation. They wouldn't, wouldn't have believed it. Well, we know now how retired Diageo executive and whiskey historian Dr. Nick Morgan has been keeping busy during the lockdowns in Great Britain. His new book, Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey But Are Too Afraid to Ask, has just been published in a partnership with the Whiskey Exchange. It's a book that has just as much for longtime connoisseurs as it does for newcomers and it punctures some of the myths surrounding whiskey. Nick joins me later on Whiskey Cast in depth. And we'll also discuss his recent column for the Master of Malt blog on the Scotch whiskey industry's role in perpetuating the myths around Japanese whiskey's rise and its role in fueling that rise. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and on Behind the Label. Do you think heavy char and you think it's going to taste like a campfire but it's kind of the exact opposite the news is next on this week's whiskey cast what do japan and scotland have in common you guessed it whiskey that's why doers brought these two cultures together in our newest cast series innovation introducing doers eight-year japanese smooth We took the doers you know and love and finished it in rare Mizanar oak casks for a complex and balanced scotch whiskey like no other. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. You know, people always ask me, does Redbreast go better with ice or without? Would it go well with figs, dark chocolate, apple crumble? Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. We've mentioned direct to consumer sales a bit over the last year or so, especially since Kentucky joined the handful of states that allow distillers to ship whiskeys directly to consumers. Beam Suntory has now kicked off what may become a trend among U.S. based whiskey makers. It's launching the Barreled and Boxed program. Essentially, it's a whiskey club that sends members a quarterly shipment of special whiskeys, along with access to behind-the-scenes events and VIP access to distillery tours. Right now, the program is only available to residents of Kentucky and the District of Columbia. By the way, the first package includes Freddie Noe's fifth chapter in his Little Book series of whiskeys. That was unveiled this week, and this year's edition is called The Invitation. Freddie blended two five- and 15-year-old Kentucky bourbons, along with some three-year-old 100% malted rye, to create The Invitation. It's available at U.S. retailers with a recommended retail price of $125 a bottle. And it'll be combined with one of the few remaining bottles of the original Little Book Chapter 1 in the inaugural Barreled and Boxed release. The price tag for that is $270. Freddie was not available for interviews this week. We are hoping to hear from him on an upcoming episode. Meanwhile, Heaven Hill has unveiled this year's edition of Parker's Heritage Collection. It's an 11-year-old wheat whiskey matured in heavily charred barrels and is a follow-up to the previous heavily charred bourbon and rye whiskies in the Parker's Heritage Collection range. Longtime Heaven Hill master distiller Parker Beam died four years ago after a battle with ALS, but current master distiller Connor O'Driscoll says this whiskey still has Parker's fingerprints all over it. The whole heavy charred barrel was his thing. 
and uh, you know that there are so there were seventy five barrels of each one. Um, that's it. With, other than the base series that he laid down, we haven't done it since. So, you know, who knows? I mean, th- this is one of the great things about our uh, our innovative mindset, if you will, that we're not averse to trying things again, trying them differently. You know, that worked. Let's see if it works in this space, that space. You know, so we've, we've got all kinds of crazy little pots bubbling and boiling in the background somewhere. Once again, a portion of the sales from this year's release will go to the ALS Association. It'll be available starting next month with a recommended retail price of $139.99 a bottle. And we'll hear more from Connor later on in our Behind the Label segment. Elsewhere in the bourbon world, Barrel Bourbon's latest batch is out now. Batch number 30 is a blend of straight bourbons between 5 and 15 years old, all distilled and matured in Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, and Wyoming. While Joe Beatrice and his team at Barrel Craft Spirits never say where they get their whiskeys from, I have a pretty good idea where those Wyoming barrels came from. It's bottled at 58.7% ABV and carries a recommended retail price of $90 a bottle. The Del Moore is launching a new luxury collection with six different whiskeys representing the last six decades, including the last whiskey created under the McKenzie family's ownership in 1951. There are also bottlings from 1967, 1979, 1980, 1995, and 2000, including the first whiskey distilled at the Delmore at the start of this century on January 1st, 2000. Longtime master blender Richard Patterson selected the whiskeys for the decades collection, as the Delmore's Claire Clark told reporters this week on a Zoom call. Each whiskey marks a key moment in our distillery's history and each decanter captures that liquid personification that we talk about a lot of endeavour and dedication to reaching the potential that we have within our casks and also within our whiskey makers. There is only one complete set of all six bottlings. The Decade's number 6 collection will go on the auction block at Sotheby's in Hong Kong this October, with part of the proceeds going to the V&A Dundee Design Museum in Scotland. Fifteen sets of the number 5 collection, with everything except that 1951 bottle, will go on sale at luxury retailers in the U.S., the U.K., and France, along with travel retail outlets in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China, The price tag, £200,000 for each set. 25 sets of the number 4 collection will be available in the UK and France at £100,000 each. That collection leaves out the 1951 and 1967 whiskeys. Compass Box has unveiled its latest limited edition blended malt. Canvas takes a blend of single malts from Tomatin, Glen Burgie, Glen Elgin, and the Old Imperial distilleries, then put them into barrels seasoned with Vino Naranja, Spanish fortified wine, infused with orange peels. Canvas is available now in the UK and other markets for £100 a bottle and will arrive in the US starting next month. They've also taken the picture frame that design agency Stranger and Stranger created for the Canvas label and are making it available on the Compass Box website for you to fill in with your own designs. The best might just make it onto their social media feeds. Ireland's Connacht Whiskey Company in County Mayo has unveiled its first mature whiskey. Connacht Single Malt Batch No. 1 is four years old and was first matured in ex-bourbon barrels with final maturation in ex-sherry casks. Unlike many Irish whiskies, it's only double distilled, and master distiller Robert Cassell told reporters during the launch Friday that that's for a reason. Why not? Why do more of the same? You know, nobody wants more of the same with a different label. You know, triple distilled, while it is like the signature element of what Irish whiskey is, and we all know, um, double distilled has a lot of character. And if you're trying to do something that features 
the character of the locally grown grains sticking to a double distillation with a lower proof on the outlet with shorter stills, especially on the wash still, you know, leads to all of that greater character. So the choice was really differentiation and flavor. The whiskey is available through the Connect website and other online retailers for €64.99 a bottle. That's about $76 at current exchange rates. It's also expected to be available in the U.S. soon. Now, one of the projects for Cassell and his colleagues at both Connect in Ireland and New Liberty Distillery in Philadelphia was Brothership, a blend of 10-year-old Irish and American whiskeys released a couple of years ago. Another similar blend is hitting the market now. Keeper's Heart comes from the new O'Shaughnessy Distilling Company in Minneapolis, which hired master distiller Brian Nation away from Ireland's Middleton Distillery. He created the blend of sourced Irish single pot still and grain whiskies with a sourced four-year-old American rye. What I found was that when you're putting, you know, pot still and rye together, you've got two fairly flavorsome whiskies that can really compete against each other if they're not if they're not in the correct balance and if they're not in the correct proportions. And I found that bringing some grain whiskey into it actually allowed the whiskies to work well together. And the grain whiskey does show through in the in the overall blend itself as well. So we're really happy with the with what we ended up with. Brian joined us on Friday night's Happy Hour live webcast from the distillery, which starts the commissioning process this week before going into full production. I'll have my tasting notes for Keeper's Heart in just a few minutes. Speaking of blends, most of us associate Molson Coors with the beer business, but the beer giant is getting into the whiskey business for the first time. It has teamed up with the Bardstown Bourbon Company in Kentucky to create the Five Trail whiskey brand. The whiskey is a blend of Colorado single malt from an unnamed distillery that's blended with three different bourbons. It'll be available at first in Colorado, New York, Georgia, and Nevada for around $60 a bottle. And it is key to note that Molson Coors is one of the largest buyers of barley in North America for its beers. Its blog hinted that they may start making some whiskeys from the barley malted at its facility in Colorado. I've reported before on the shortage of maturation warehouse space for distilleries in Ireland, and there's yet another controversy over plans to build new warehouses. The Irish Examiner reports West Cork Distillers is facing strong opposition to plans for a 16 million euro warehouse complex in Tullig. More than 800 people have signed an online petition asking Cork County Council to block the plans. They're arguing that the rural town does not have the roads or infrastructure to handle an industrial project of that scale. One critic told the examiner the road to the site is barely wide enough for a tractor, let alone large trucks. Finally, while there are still no arrests in June's break-in at the Tullibardine Distillery Visitors Center in Scotland, police in Glasgow are looking for suspects in an even more brazen break-in. The Scottish Sun reports thieves cut through the padlocks on a gate at the Dewar's main blending and bottling facility in Glasgow overnight July 31st. Seven minutes later, they had opened up four separate trailers full of whiskeys and gin and drove off with thousands of dollars worth of Aberfeldy single malts, Dewar's white label, and Bombay sapphire gin. According to the Sun, it's being seen as an inside job since there was only one security guard on duty at the time, and not only did the thieves know exactly which trailers to target, but it was one of the rare times when loaded trailers had been left at the facility overnight because of a shortage of truck drivers. Police Scotland is asking anyone with information about the theft to contact them. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Join us Friday nights at 5 p.m. New York time for the Happy Hour Live webcast each week. We have guests from all over the world along with your comments. We're live on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. 
If you missed Friday night's webcast with Brian Nation and Ryan Maybe, the co-founder of Jay Rieger & Company in Kansas City, the on-demand replay is available at our YouTube channel, and the podcast version drops later this week. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts has a Heaven's Door whiskey tasting this Wednesday night. Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville, Kentucky has a Bardstown Bourbon Company tasting with Steve Nally that same night. Bonhams has its next whiskey auction this Friday in Hong Kong. Art Beg's Monsters of Smoke bus tours have stops planned this week in Pittsburgh and Seattle. Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore has its next Whiskey on the Waterfront celebration this Saturday. The Whiskey Exchange in London has an online Rye So Serious tasting August 25th. Castle and Key Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky has its next Springhouse Music Series night September 1st. And the Bay Area Houston Whiskey and Wine Fest is set for September 5th in Alvin, Texas. Finally, tickets are on sale for the American Whiskey Convention. It's coming up on September 10th in Philadelphia. Right now, we have 182 in-person and virtual events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Remember, all in-person events are still subject to change on short notice, depending on local health restrictions, so make sure you check in with event organizers before you make any travel plans. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. People never forget the person who introduced them to Redbreast. And then those people go on to introduce others to Redbreast. And soon the flock has grown exponentially. It's like a pyramid scheme. Without any of the bad stuff, of course. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast In-Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. This is the time of year when we're starting to see not only new whiskeys, but new whiskey books coming out ahead of the holidays. And it appears that a lot of writers have been spending their lockdown time working on new whiskey books. For former Diageo Scotch Whiskey executive and historian Dr. Nick Morgan, his new book, Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey But Are Too Afraid to Ask, is his second book released during the pandemic. Last December, his book, A Long Stride, looked at the 200-year history of Johnny Walker, and it was his final project before retiring from Diageo. His new book is a partnership with the Whiskey Exchange. It looks at the wider world of whiskeys and punches some holes in myths along the way. What's the audience for this book? It seems to me after reading it that it's... Got as much in there for the connoisseur who's been around whiskey for years as it does for the newcomer. Well, that's right, Mark. I mean, I think when when the idea of the book was dreamt up and as I wrote it, it was really to try and write something that would appeal to almost anyone and everyone who had an interest in whiskey. So I tried to make sure that there was stuff in there that would entertain and, um, and maybe occasionally enrage uh, people with a lot of knowledge. But I also tried to write it so it would be accessible for those people who maybe like whiskey and were just thinking of sort of stepping over the boundary into knowing more about it and finding out more. So, you know, it was, it's, it's a difficult balancing act, but but I really wanted it to be accessible so that anyone who could pick it up and find it interesting. You know. Kind of putting people on the lip of the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> yes, if you will. Yes. One of the things I found really interesting was the way that you've worked your historian background with both the uh, general history and whiskey history into this, uh, talking about folks like Stuart Hasty, the people who don't get a lot of the credit they really deserve. Tell me about Stuart Hasty. Well, he was he was a remarkable man in in my opinion. Um, he was born in Edinburgh. He served um, in the British Army in the First World War, and in fact drove a tank in the first tank engagement in the First World War, which was during the Battle of the Somme. So, and if you know anything about early tank people, you'll know they were all a bit crazy because you had to be to get into one of those things. 
Um, he'd been trained at uh, William Younger's Brewery in Edinburgh in um, malting science and fermenting science. So he had a sort of technical background in those areas. And after the war, by means that aren't entirely clear to me, he was appointed by Peter Mackey of Whitehorse Distillers and, of course, Lagavulin fame to go and manage the lab that Mackey had established at Hazelburn Distillery down in Campbelltown. So Hasty went down there and, according to Mackey, totally transformed the whole distillation regime in White in Whitehorse Distillers, and they had three or four distilleries um, at, at, at the time, by trying to trying to accommodate, and I talk about this in the book, and it was so interesting reading about it, trying to accommodate sort of traditional practice, you know, the, the old guy that works in the distillery who's done it that way forever because he was taught to do it when he was 20 years old, you know. Um, so, so to mix that sort of approach with a more scientific and rigorous and analytical approach. And certainly one of the keys to that was, was problem solving, which meant if something went wrong in a distillery, you got hit by the men in white coats who would come out, come and turn the place over to try and find out what was wrong. Now, Hasty actually, when Mackey's went into, or Whitehorse Distillers rather, went into the distillers company, uh, Hasty was transferred over to the distillers company, and he very quickly was put in charge of um, what what became known as Scottish Malt Distillers. So he was responsible for um, for all malt whiskey production uh, in the DCL, and he actually created the sort of regime that regime of men in white coats fixing problems, um, very much a consistency driven regime. He established that very strongly in the distillers company. And really, it was still very evidently there when I worked for Diageo. You know, it was just the way that you did things, just the way that you did things. Really, really a remarkable man. His son also held a senior position uh, in the distillers company. And um, I think it's people like these that need celebrating a bit more than the guys that we hear about all the time. You know, so I was very happy to write about him. Some of those folks that you talk about, uh, that we hear about all the time, are the master distillers, and you kind of puncture that with the uh, unspoken uh, comment that a lot of us always seem to have at whiskey shows when we see these master distillers behind the stand. Who's actually back there making the whiskey? Well, you know, Mark, it's just a question I, I, you know, I, I put out there. I mean, clearly we know the sort of, sort of certain reality of things, but um, I, I've never, I've never quite liked the, even the phrase master distiller. I was trying to find out when it first came into use, which I think was. I thought it was actually in the 1990s, but I found a couple of usages of it in the 70s or 80s, but really it's a 90s phenomenon. Who do we blame for it? Do you know? Well, I, 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 I would tend to blame one of my former colleagues called Mike Collings, who was one half of the duo that dreamt up the classic malts, and Mike was a really great marketing guy. That was his sort of phrase, and certainly I could see in my early years in, in um, United Distillers the distillery managers was was somehow becoming master distillers. And you just saw the way that the language sort of changed over a five or six year period, which is, you know, that's the way it always happens in marketing. Because now you can actually go to Harriet Watt and get a master's degree in brewing and distilling and call yourself a master distiller. That, that, Back that, then you couldn't. Yeah. That, that's more of a thing. I think uh, nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. You used the term a minute ago, men in white coats. And obviously that has changed over the years. Back in, Stuart Hastie's day, it was men in white coats. Now it's men and women in white coats. And this book is really being praised for being a lot more gender neutral and more representative and more diverse in the people that you're quoting than other whiskey books. How deliberate was that? And give me a sense of what you've seen in changes over the years. Well, for, first off, Mark, I'd actually say that there were two people working in that lab in Hazelburn. And one was hasty, and the other one was a lady who was his laboratory assistant. And I think actually women came into that side of whiskey quite often into lab work. And Maureen Robinson, you know, who's absolute figurehead of blending and whiskey making or whiskey creating, if you will, still in Diageo, started off on a lab bench, you know, way, way, way back in the, in the 1960s. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have said that, but anyway. It wasn't the 60s. It couldn't have been the 60s. It was the 70s. Sorry, Maureen. But the book, you know, the book was written 
it wasn't it wasn't written it, this is going to sound weird it wasn't written to be deliberately inclusive so i didn't have something above my computer that said be inclusive right when i wrote it the book was written to represent how i and actually how sukinder singh who's sort of sponsor of the book in some respects saw the whiskey industry and how how it how it really is and you know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful picture of a blending room and there's a woman in there blending whiskey. Well, fact of the matter is, if you go into most blending rooms today, there will be women in there blending whiskey. So let's let's have that illustration. You know, why would you have a man in a bloody tweed jacket again, which is the sort of cliche image that is conjured up for both distillery managers, blenders, whatever it might be. So the thing about the book was really, you know, and it's part of that accessibility as well that we talked about earlier. Mark, it was just about making the book representative, if you will, inclusive, um, but representing the world of whiskey as it very much is today, or at least as I see it through my eyes. It may be other people see it through different eyes, but you know, this the world you see in that book is my world, if you will. What's the biggest myth that you puncture in this book? <laughs> Well, I was thinking about that song because someone was asking me about that. Besides the one about Jack Daniels and bourbon, because we already took care of that one, and uh, the Jack Daniels guys disagree with you, as we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do. I'm sure some people disagree with quite a lot of the stuff in the book. It, there, there are some little, there are quite a lot of little things in there, but they're quite big when you add them all up. So there's a lot on casks and the history of cask use, and in particular, all this stuff about sherry casks that you read all the time and what sort of sherry casks it was that people really like to use. So I was able to find a lot on that from um, the trade press, 19th century trade press. And so I think the section on sherry casks m- might not represent what most people think um, or has uh, believed in the past was, was the case. So I think that's that's a bit different. Um some of the stuff on Irish whiskey, which I would have loved to have spent more time on uh, if I could have, was, was, was interesting. And particularly, I recall the fact that the two distilleries that were most proud of the Irish whiskey they made were the Caledonian Distillery in Edinburgh and uh, Cameron Bridge Distillery in Fife. So that whole thing about how categories actually developed which goes on actually from the 1830s to the late 1930s when there's actually a test case to try and say, hang on a minute, where, where is where is Scotch whiskey made? Where is Irish whiskey made? And there was a test case and the Finance Act of 38 or 39 then contained this clause, which had not been included in the sort of first attempt at a definition back in the early 1900s. Um, so that idea of the distinctiveness of whiskey runs through the book as well, you know. We can expand on that into Japanese whiskey, which you cover in a page or two in the book, but in far more detail from the Scottish perspective on the uh, Master of Malt blog a couple of weeks ago, in which uh, the whole controversy about the new Japanese whiskey rules that are gradually going into effect uh, has uh, really sort of acknowledged what had been an open secret within the industry for probably 30, 40, 50 years now about the amount of Scotch whiskey that was actually going into Japanese whiskey, air quotes included. You could have easily made the argument that most Japanese whiskey back then was actually Scotch whiskey, just like the Irish whiskey that was coming from uh, Cameron Bridge was uh, actually Scotch whiskey at the time. Well, uh, and and just before we go into Japanese whiskey, I mean, one of the things is in the 19th century and early 20th century, a a lot of cheaper Scotch whiskey, and particularly what you would call tap whiskey. So there was sort of whiskey you'd be served in pubs, not uh, not proprietary brands, was often blended between Scotch whiskey and proper Irish whiskey from from Ireland. Um, So so there is a tradition of some degree of, let's say, a lack of transparency around uh, around blending sometimes. And what I was doing in, in, in the piece on Japanese whiskey, and some of that's in this book, but not, not all the detail of it, um, is really just looking back at how that started and what, what scale it was at, because I think it's probably at a scale back in the 60s and 70s that's larger than people might have realised. 
the way it was deployed by, as far as we can understand, by um, Japanese distillers to promote their high-end brands and the way they were doing that in particular to try and boost and enhance their reputation over Scotch whiskey, which in Japan was considered obviously to be at the time to be the, um, you know, to be the ultimate sort of style of whiskey. So I just looked at that and I had some interesting information from, from a variety of sources. You know, I, I think one of the conclusions I came to, which people have never really seemed to have said is, well, if you want to say whose fault this was, it was probably the people in Scotland who were selling the whiskey to, you know, the Japanese guys. And that was principally four or five companies. Two of them had large overseas owners, um, Hiram Walker and Seagram's. Um, and the rump of the um, of the distilling industry represented by the DCL, the old distillers company, now in effect, Diageo, uh, refused to have anything to do with it. So the industry was actually split. It was absolutely split down the middle. And there were a number of attempts made to try and reconcile the views to come to an industry-wide view, which failed. And, and certainly the, the viewpoint very publicly expressed by the DCL, by Adam Burgius from William Teacher, who was also chairman of the Scotch Whiskey Association, um, was that allowing these Scotch whiskies to be used in Japanese blends would have a long-term damaging effect on Scotch whiskey because it was helping to promote Japanese blends and help them improve their quality. And that's where I sort of left it, Mark. I didn't move up to today and, and the controversy, uh, if, if there is one today, about brands and what's in them and what isn't, because there's seems to me that until my colleagues in Japan actually tell us what's been in these blends for the past 10 or 15 years, no one's really going to know. You know, there's a big area of ambiguity. Who's responsible, do you think, in hindsight now for the uh, the Scotch Whiskey Act in 2009 banning the export of single casks of single malt whiskey, that it had to be bottled in Scotland, but that blends could be exported in bulk? How much of this was responsible for that? Because... Uh, we know that at least one distillery that was owned by the Japanese and still is, uh, Ben Nevis, most of its single malt output was being used in Japanese whiskies, frankly. I don't think, Mark, it was particularly um, that I don't think that particular clause was particularly prompted by um, whiskey going to, to Japan. Um, not all of which was going in casks. It's my understanding a lot of it did go seriously in bulk. You know, the, the word was used properly but i think that was more simply about the concern in, amongst the swa and its member companies to try and do everything they could to maintain the integrity of single cast bottlings wherever they were because you know casts were going to france were going to germany belgium netherlands all over the place so this wasn't a japanese issue and i think it was really a case of trying to pull that one back and say no if we're bottling single malts bottling single cast single malts it's got to be done in scotland you know you point out, and a lot of folks don't know this, that uh, back in 1929, after Masataka Takatsuru got back from Japan, Suntory actually tried to market a Scotch whiskey in Japan. That's an interesting story that most people don't remember. And in, and in, uh, and in other Asian markets as well, or at least, well, they did sell it, I think, and they were certainly trying to get trademarks for it. And it was called, which it, this, it, this enraged the distillers company uh, more than you can imagine. And I do talk about this a little bit in the Johnny Walker book, actually. Um, but they called it an old island whiskey. Well, I think for Johnny Walker in particular, who'd been selling old Highland whiskey for, for, for many years, that was a bit too near the knuckle. And um, so the DCL and other Scotch whiskey companies lobbied governments and they lobbied the uh, Japanese embassy and Japanese trade. How was it called? The uh, Trade Association or, or whatever it was about this. And they hit, they hit a blank. Um, with, with the, the, the Japanese authorities. But there were subsequently changes uh, around um, what, what you might loosely call passing off um, in Japanese law, which I think aided the position of the Scotch whiskey people a little bit, but not really, not really that much. And while we uh, romanticize to a certain amount the uh, Takatsuru tours of Scotland and working in the distilleries there, you point out in the blog that that actually led to almost a, a total ban on Japanese visitors after that for some time, right? Well, I think the D well, this is again, this is the DCL, and and they were outraged when Centauri released this old Scotch whiskey product, 
And I don't think they'd really understood fully why Takatsuru had been in uh, Campbelltown. I mean, that he was in Hazelburn. He, he'd been in Glasgow University. There were strong academic contacts by that point between Glasgow University in particular and Japan. And someone he knew at Glasgow University had got him into um, got him into Hazelburn and possibly elsewhere. But I don't think it, they fully realised. In fact, uh, Hasty, Stuart Hasty, in the late thirties, I can't quite remember the exact quote, but he talks about um, some Japanese gentlemen coming to Scotland and making friends with some distillers and making notes and sketches and then taking them back home with them. Well, you know, it's sort of industrial espionage. But a much nicer story to tell, a much rosier story to tell, is the one about Takatsuru and his marriage to a Scots lady, which, you know, I say in the article on Master of Malt, is almost used, I think, by Japanese distillers to represent a symbolic, you know, um, alliance between these two countries. So it's all that romantic stuff, which everyone loves, you know, TV series about it and all that, for heaven's sake. But the reality is a little different. And throughout the book, one of the things I'm trying to do is just point out that actually there's lots of romance and there's lots of stuff that people really want to believe, but the reality is a bit different. And you need to understand the reality to really understand the business and how it works. You, know. you now have the freedom to discuss that reality in more detail after retiring from Diageo. Where do you see the whiskey world headed right now from your uh, your vantage point Having been around for 30 years at Diageo and DCL and UDV before that, where do you see things going forward from here? That's a very hard question to say, because if you'd have asked anyone 30 years ago, Mark, I can tell you the one thing they would not have described was the situation that we have in whiskey today, not just in Scotland, but all over the world. I mean, whiskey, you know, it's just an explosion of stuff going on and um, some of it great probably some of it not so great but that's what you would expect there's so much money coming into uh in, into the business from from investors who want who want to get into the distilling scene and 30 years ago people would have just laughed at you if you described this situation they wouldn't have, wouldn't have believed it and what's it like to be like in 30 years time or 10 years time well i suspect what will happen is that um inevitably because it's the way of the industry there will be more consolidation so i think a lot of the people that have come in both in the united states for example i'm not just talking about scotland i think a lot of the people that have come in won't last and and that's what we've seen in the past some will are really strong ones ones that have got a real business sort of motivation and again it is all about business you know if you, if you haven't got that you're not going to you're not going to stick around and then I think also, um, as, as is already happening on a small scale, some of these new distillers and distilleries will be picked up by the large companies as well. So I think inevitably over a 10, 15, 20 year period, that's, that's what we'll see. The overall, the industry is going to be much better and much richer for it because you've got more diversity of products. And that's what, what we need within each category. You know, we need more new stuff. And more new people coming to it with new ideas and new approaches. And I think any industry needs that. Otherwise, you, you just ossify, you know, which certainly I think happened to Scotch in the 70s and 80s, probably, you know. Do you see another bubble coming like we saw in the 80s and as we've seen over time with just too much whiskey and not enough demand for it? Or have we finally gotten whiskey demand mature enough worldwide that we can uh, absorb all of this? Well, that's a hard question, Mark, because there's lots of um, economic history theory behind counter-cyclical graphs and all this sort of stuff, you know. Um, I mean, with, with Scotch whiskey, which I know a little more about than others, certainly I think has got its act together on inventory planning far more carefully than 20 or 30 years ago. Um, the world's a lot bigger now. So, you know, typically one market up, another market down. So that helps balance out business. But then, of course, you get the totally unforeseen. You have a global pandemic. Well, no one saw that coming, you know. And so much of Scotch whiskey's business is in global travel. What's global travel? Will that come back in 10 years' time? I mean, who, 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 who knows? Uh, and, and, of course, the on-trade suffered so badly all over, all over the world because of lockdowns and, and, and the like.
So, you know, you can plan as much as you like and you can get it, get it as close to a perfect science as, as, as you wish, but there's always something going to come and trip you up when you're not expecting it. That's the problem. As a historian, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the phrase, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. What's the biggest lesson whiskey leaders need to remember going forward so that they don't repeat the mistakes of the past? Well, I think, I think the, the biggest recent mistake of the past was the um, absolute confidence in growth that was instilled in people in the 1960s and 1970s when Scotch was recovering from, from the worst possible time it had had in the interwar years and through the Second World War. And, you know, so much money was put into increasing production, principally in the early 50s and into the 60s. So much whiskey was being sold to the United States, blended whiskey, of course, principally. And then also um, so much whiskey was suddenly being sold to Latin American countries, which hadn't, I mean, whiskey had been there, scotch had been there, but not, not significantly. And it just seemed as though this was never going to end. And, you know, you look at the production statistics and it's absolutely off the scale and the sales are off the scale. And you can see that from a couple of the Johnny Walker graphs in that book. And I think people were lulled into a false sense of security and thought this this was never going to end. And and of course, then what happened was that you had the real economic, well, a number of economic recessions, oil crisis. I mean, you just had this sequence of events. Uh, and in the end, there were layoffs all over Scotland at bottling plants. Distilleries became silent. And then like Brewer and Port Ellen closed, some never to reemerge. Um now, in theory today, that shouldn't happen because, as I've said, the forecasting is much better. I think people have, have an under, do have an understanding of the past and have an understanding of, 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 of what can go wrong. But you do, you know, as governments around all around the world have, have found out over the past 18 months, you do somewhere need to have a plan about what you're going to do if the very worst thing you can imagine happens, you know. And I just have to hope that Diageo, who do a lot of planning in a very clever company, and Pernod Ricard and Edrington and all these big guys have got those plans in place. You know. the, in case of fire, break glass, uh, plan B option, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Nick Morgan's new book, Everything You Need to Know About Whiskey But Are Too Afraid to Ask, is available exclusively through the Whiskey Exchange through September 16th. After that, it'll be available worldwide in both hardcover and as an ebook, with U.S. hardcover availability coming in November. You can pre order it now through your local independent bookstore, but if you don't have one nearby, we have included an Amazon link for it, along with one for his Master of Malt blog column on Japanese whiskeys, in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard. Oban Single Malt Scotch Whiskey is offering the chance to immerse yourself in Oban and the whiskey making process through the Oban Abode experience. Two winners will receive a trip to Scotland to stay in the Oban Abode, just steps from the distillery. To learn more and enter, visit obenabode.obenwhiskey.com. Complete rules are available at the website. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start with the Keeper's Heart Irish Plus American Whiskey we heard about during the news. Once again, it's a blend of Irish single pot still and grain whiskeys with American rye, bottled at 47% ABV. The nose has a honey sweetness with a touch of baking spices, along with toasted oak, caramel, and a hint of dried fruits. The taste has a good balance of sweetness and spice, with touches of clove and allspice, complemented by peaches, apricots, and a hint of lemon. Honey, butterscotch, and a hint of oak add complexity in the background. The finish is long, smooth, and fades away gently. I'm scoring Keeper's Heart a 92. Connacht Whiskey Company's debut single malt is double distilled, as we heard during the news. It's also bottled at 47% ABV. 
The nose is malty and grassy with a bit of straw and hints of citrus and ginger. The taste is tart, syrupy, thick, and malty with honey and butterscotch notes at first, followed by a nice bite of lemon pepper and ginger, along with barley sugar and grass clippings in the background. The finish is long and aromatic with a slight citrusy tartness. I'm scoring Connacht Single Malt Batch Number 1, a 93. Ryan Maybe of Kansas City's Jay Rieger & Company joined us on the webcast Friday night. Rieger's is releasing its first bottled-in-bond rye whiskey today at the distillery, and it's almost six years old, dating back to the fall season of 2015. Of course, it's bottled at 50% ABV. The nose is nice and aromatic with baking spices, toasted oak, caramel, vanilla, and hints of baking chocolate, dried fruits, and maple. The taste is thick and spicy with clove, cinnamon, and black pepper notes that fade slowly to reveal honey, cocoa, toasted oak, and hints of dried fruits in the background. The finish is long, spicy, and warming. I'm scoring the J. Rieger & Company 2021 Bottled in Bond Rye, a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. Their tequila cask-finished rye received a gold medal in this year's San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It's rye whiskey finished in extra Añejo tequila barrels, displaying notes of agave and vanilla, dried fig, and honey. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. They're offering WhiskeyCast listeners a free virtual guided tasting. Purchase bottles from your local retailer, and a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each one. Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WhiskeyCast, all one word, to access. Please drink responsibly. Japanese whiskey retailer Decanta has released the Kayu Blended World Whiskey to mark its sixth anniversary. It's a blend of 26-year-old blended scotch from three different distilleries with single malts from Japan Sakashi, Osaka, and Nagahama distilleries. It's bottled at 52% ABV. The nose has an aroma of grilled fruits, hints of toffee, brown sugar, vanilla, and a touch of raspberry. The taste is thick and nectar-like with touches of pears and peaches, subtle oakiness and spices, along with hints of dates and baked apples that come out over time. The finish is long with a nice balance of lingering spices, fruit, and oak. I'm scoring Decanta's Caillou Blended World Whiskey, a 94. Finally, longtime Chivas Regal master blender Colin Scott joined the last drop late last year after retiring from Chivas Brothers. His first whiskey for the last drop is the 50-year-old Colin Scott signature blend. Only 500 bottles will be available worldwide. It's bottled at 48.7% ABV. The nose has touches of red apples, apricots, rose petals, subtle spices, and hints of roasted almonds and oak. The taste is fruity and luscious with a nice spiciness. Apple pie, apricots, and touches of caramel and toffee are complemented by subtle spices and a touch of dried flowers. The finish is very, very long and slightly floral with a nice spiciness and a hint of oak. It's not just an outstanding whiskey, but one of the best I've tasted in quite a long time. I'm scoring the last drop's Colin J.P. Scott Signature Blend, a 97. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I've added these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. 
It's been 175 years and Durer's continues to stay curious. We're proud to announce the newest addition to the innovative Durer's eight-year cast finish series of Scotch whiskey, Durer's Japanese Smooth. Brought to life by our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod, Japanese Smooth is a perfectly balanced eight-year-old Scotch whiskey that puts a pioneering and innovative focus on our aging process. After eight years in Scotland, we blend, age again, then finish this whiskey in cast made from 200-year-old Mizunara oak trees. Rare, sure, but worth it. The Mizunara oak perfectly complements the tasty notes with Dewar's Scotch whiskey. Japanese Smooth is loaded with Dewar's signature honey and floral notes, with the Japanese Mizunara oak adding exotic sweet and spicy flavors. Curious? Try this one in a perfect Japanese highball or on the rocks. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. More comments on our decision to start releasing audio podcast versions of the Friday Night Webcasts. This one from Dan Brown, who's a big fan of the idea. It saves so much data and battery life to listen podcast style too. Well, I have to admit that I'd never even thought about the impact on those with data limits on your mobile plans. We made the decision based on people heading back to work and not having as much time to catch webcasts on Fridays, depending on their time zones. But that savings on data plans makes it an even bigger advantage. Thanks, Dan. Now to last week's conversation with Dr. Tom Kimmerer and his campaign to declare the American white oak as Kentucky's official state tree. Kentucky native James Yoakum lives in New Jersey now, He used to run Cooper River Distillers down the road in Camden and posted this on our Facebook page. No, we've already had two state trees, Kentucky Coffee Tree and the Tulip Poplar, in my lifetime. Stick to one damn tree. And Laura Patrizio added this from Pennsylvania. Doesn't Kentucky get most of its oak from out of state? How could Kentucky call it their state tree? Maybe their state's official milled lumber instead? Well, while a lot of the white oak used for bourbon barrels does come from outside Kentucky, they do grow a lot of it in the Commonwealth as well. And thanks to longtime listener Tom at the Tracer Bullet on Twitter, he was traveling in Kentucky this week and shared a bunch of photos from his distillery visits with us on Twitter, usually with the line, Where am I now? He did stump me once. I thought he was at Rabbit Hole in Louisville. He was actually at the Bardstown Bourbon Company. You can see all the photos on our Twitter feed. If there's something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all that other stuff that makes whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. During the news, I talked about the latest Parker's Heritage Collection release from Heaven Hill. It's an 11-year-old wheat whiskey that's matured in heavily charred casks. Cooperages and distillers usually refer to char levels from 1 to 4, with four being the heaviest. Usually, it's about a minute or so that the cask is set on fire. Heaven Hill traditionally specifies a number three char for its barrels, about 40 seconds. But Parker Beam wanted to go all out for the barrels for his heavy char series, a number five char at 90 seconds on fire. Connor O'Driscoll points out the misconception that a lot of folks might have about the impact that heavy charring has on the whiskey. That whole heavy char thing, that's been super interesting because you think heavy char and you think it's going to taste like a campfire, but it's kind of the exact opposite. And I you know, had some long discussions with uh, our buddies at uh, ISC, Andrew Weebrink, about what's happening with the heavy char. And, you know, once it's explained, it kind of makes sense. But, you know, the, the more you char a barrel you know, the more stuff you burn off. So, you know, all those, what we call the extractives, those, you know, 
the tannins and the vanillins and all that stuff, that stuff that, you know, we typically use, you know, for a, 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 a normal, if you will, bourbon that gets burned away. And then deep in the woods, you get lots of caramelization of the sugars that are left there. So when you age, you know, something like a, a wheat whiskey, which is one of the lightest whiskeys we make, um, it doesn't get overpowered by the barrel, but it allows that, that whiskey to mature gently and softly and slowly and then pick up those caramelized notes that kind of manifest as butterscotch or roasted marshmallow, that type of thing. How much of that barrel is left, though, after the uh, number five char? Because um, you're actually setting it on fire for a while. Yeah, then. for, I mean, twice as long as normal. Um, they, obviously, there's enough, you know. Um, they call it like the alligator thing. It, it looks like, you know, a, a prehistoric alligator that the inside of the barrel does. And then you know, the, the, the red line is fairly deep down in it. But obviously, it's not burned so badly that, you know, it becomes structurally unsound. Uh, I think that would be that would probably be a number six char. I, no, the other name for a number six char is a campfire. <laughs> Thanks to Heaven Hills Connor O'Driscoll for the explanation. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. The tears of Ireland's great writers bursting with flavour, humour and angst. Bottled for you to taste. No writers were harmed in the making of this premium Irish whiskey. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, the calendar of events, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes, all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast, the email address, comments at WhiskeyCast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many, tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Just like the end of this Whiskey Cast episode, Dewar's Scotch Whiskey always makes for a smooth finish. Like our newly released Dewar's Japanese Smooth, aged for eight years in Scotland, blended then aged again before being finished for up to six months in Mizunar oak casts made from 200-year-old Japanese water oak trees. These unique casts layer distinct dry and spicy flavors to the whiskey, with aromas reminiscent of sandalwood and incense. Keep an eye out for a bottle of Dewar's Japanese Smooth at a store near you. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.